He answers when we pray. It comes from all around us. It comes from up above. What else were you? Thank you, Lissy. I don't know that we need to say anything else, but I'm going to. <laughs> you guys know I'm going to. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tommy. I see your nose is above water. Thank you, God. <laughs> for any of you who might have had a little water damage, I, uh, I will hold you in prayer for sure with that. But certainly do let us know if there's any, any needs that anyone has out there that uh, we can help with. And uh, you know, make us aware. Don't, he don't hesitate to ask. Prayer box. prayer box. Yeah, definitely put it in the prayer box, but also just let us know if there's something of, other than even more than a prayer that we can do as, as a service that we can help you with. We know how to do buildings. We do. We do. We've helped people a lot with that. Man, it's been a good thing. Well, you know, I've been uh, thinking about and praying about what I wanted to... Pardon me a second. Oh, thank God for water. Amen. Wow. Yeah, and thank uh, Laura for showing us how well Lake Travis is rising up. And <laughs> you guys see the post that she's done? It's pretty. It's it is a blessing. It is a blessing to have the rain, but we, we just didn't expect it all at once. And so, <laughs> so I've been think, thinking about and praying about what it is I wanted to share with you guys, and I, I kept coming back to um, and and actually I remember someone asking about this some time ago, and I, I made a request to. Uh, uh, talk about how we build authentic community and also authentic relationships. And, um, you know, and it's a, it is something that I think is an important part of a spiritual community is to learn the practice of that. And it is not always an easy thing, to be perfectly honest, because we've been taught how not to be authentic, haven't we? We've got, got a lot of good lessons about putting on our game faces in fact, we were just driving in this morning, and there was a little notice, uh, it was a, a thing on NPR about putting on your game face. And, and sometimes when we have things going on, we've been taught to put on our game face. And also we have um, ways that we are and we show up with each other that, um, that you know, we're, we're not really in a place where we're really being, uh, hearing our own heart, you might say. Last week I talked about this idea a little bit about you know, tuning into the energy and the intelligence and the wisdom of the heart. And part of the wisdom of the heart is recognizing there are times when you're in your heart space that your heart is where you really feel. And it's where you really feel what's going on. And it can be sometimes very uh, challenging to feel what's going on, can it? Sometimes we are really taught that, you know, well, just, you know, put it aside, stiff upper lip and move on kind of thing. But there are times when we really do need to be open and honest with ourselves and with each other. And there are times that uh, in any spiritual community and in any relationship, there are going to be conflicts. And that's part of the thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about today. One of the things that we adopted in this community shortly after I came here, and I've actually uh, in, invited and encouraged the adoption of this in every unity group that I have been the minister of. And I came across 12 principles for agreeing and disagreeing in love. And they are principles that are, are based upon spiritual teachings and biblical principles. And my understanding is they originally came out of the <clears throat> Mennonite church uh, for the Center for Peace and Justice. Those of you who may not be familiar, but the Mennonites have been very active in, in working in the peace community. And they're very practical, practical steps.
for how we can be in relationship with each other as a community, but there are also very practical steps, I find, if we will practice them, in our love relationships, in our family relationships, in our uh, work relationships. If we, will use some of, if we will use these principles, we'll find ourselves being able to be in an energy and a consciousness of connection with people on a much deeper level and a much more honest level in a way that will allow us to let our own light shine and at the same time be able to support others in helping them to grow and develop in their own way and how they themselves can experience more of the presence of God within themselves and each other. Well, you know, I always like to have stories when I start off and talking about relationships. And there was uh, one morning there was a terrible snowstorm. And so uh, there was a mother of three small children and she was outside shoveling the snow on her driveway, and a neighbor was also shoveling snow, and he, he noticed at the same time, he yells out to her, he says, you know, why, why isn't your husband outside helping you with the chores and helping you um, shovel the snow? And he says, well, she said, we, you know, we have someone needed to stay inside with the children, and so, um, so we d decided we would draw straws to see who would, you know, ha go out and shovel and who would stay inside with the children. And she says, oh, I see. Well, so the neighbor said, well, I'm really sorry about your bad luck. And she said, what are you talking about? I won. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's different ways of settling agree uh, uh, disagreements. And drawing straws may be one of those ways. But I would suggest to you there are other ways of settling agreements. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. That, you know, as a spiritual community, we want to grow in our ability to be in relationship with each other. And I'm not doing this because there's conflict going on in our community. I'm not aware of any real conflict going on in our community, but I suspect there are people who have personalities in here that get pushed by other personalities in here. Right? It's just we're human, and we do have personalities, and sometimes we get our buttons pushed. I know that I occasionally have gotten my buttons pushed, not necessarily by people in this community, but um, Julie and I, but, <laughs> but maybe, no, <laughs> no ping, finger pointing, of course, but <laughs> just kidding. The thing that I um, honor, uh, I really appreciate about this community is that we do recognize and acknowledge that, yes, we're going to have disagreements. And if we can do that in all of our relationships and honor that and recognize that that's not about being wrong or right. It really is learning how to understand the differences and understand different perceptions and different ways of seeing things. And that every one of us has a different way of understanding and we're all standing in different places so we have different perspectives. And if we can recognize and see those perspectives, we will find that we have a much wholer perspective in life. I came across another wonderful story I love uh, about a woman sitting in an airport and she was getting ready to take a red-eye flight and she was kind of tired and it was around midnight and so she was hungry so she went to one of the little shops and bought herself some cookies and she sat down and uh, opened her handbag and, and was searching in to for her book to read and a man sat down next to her. And the next thing you know, he opened a box of cookies and was eating one of them. Well, this kind of upset her a bit, you know. But he thought, well, he's only, he only ate one, you know. That's no big deal. So. But then he took another one. So she said, well, and then she took one and ate it. But rather than getting, you know, in a row with him, she just decided to let it go. And, and uh, he took another one, and then she took another one. And he took another one, and she took another one. And then finally there was one last cookie, and he held it up and said, would you like to share it with me? And she got mad, just was like, what do you mean? And so just grabbed it and ran into the plane as it boarded the plane. And as she got on the plane, she was settling in and decided she, oh, it was just, she was still pretty upset. She was, you know, how, you know, how dare this guy, you know? What? And so she reached in her bag to get her book and discovered her box of cookies. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> now, I know none of us have ever made any kind of mistakes like that. But sometimes we have differences, 
and we don't say something about it. And sometimes when we don't say something about it, that can be as challenging and as difficult as saying something about it. So there are times when we do need to be able to speak our truth. But how do we do that? How do we do that and speak our truth and be honest and be sincere and not necessarily do it in a way that is to be in, with the intent of being right or being hurtful, but to be really honor those that we're with? How do we honor each other in spiritual community? How do we honor each other in our marriage relationships? How do we honor our children and still have disagreements? I think it's one of the most important spiritual lessons that we can have. If we could all learn to do this, uh, even in our governments, and recognize that we are going to have differences, but do so without demonizing those who have different points of view. And we could have a more peaceful world. We could have a more peaceful place to live. Will you turn on our projector over there? One of the things that we agreed to do in this community as a, our leadership and our board, back even before we changed our name, and so you'll see the old name on this document. Is it coming on? Um, we signed and um, uh, committed to a covenant called Agreeing and Disagreeing in Love. And all of our, our board members, our leadership, have agreed to operate and to work with these because we know that there are times when we have votes that we don't always agree on how we need to move forward with things. But what we have agreed on is when we do have disagreements that we're going to go back to these 12 principles and use these 12 principles as a way of reminding ourselves of how we want to be in spiritual community with each other. So this week we're going to talk about the first ones. And so we are agreeing and disagreeing in love. Thank you, Steve. Can you adjust that down? There we go. This is starting off with our mission statement to remind us of who we are and what we've decided that we are, uh, uh, agreed to be a part of. And so our mission, we, see, we say this every Sunday, but then there are also our values. We look at what it is that we value as a spiritual community. And then if you'll scroll down for me, Steve, a little more, there we go. And let's bring those up right there. That's perfect. First of all, one of the first things is that we accept that there will probably be disagreements. There will be conflict. We don't try to say that there's never going to be a conflict. There's never going to be a disagreement. There's never going to be, a, a, even for that matter, upset in, in our community. But when we do have our, find ourselves in that place where we are feeling conflicted with someone, and I, I think these are very valuable to use with our children, with our staff, with our, with our people that we work for, with, work with, we can really find that there are ways of working with these principles. So we acknowledge that conflict is a normal part of life in our church, in our marriages, in our, in our, uh, anybody not. Testing, one, two, three. All right, there we go. See, we're back in agreement here. All right. In Romans chapter 14, verse 1 through 8, Paul writes, Now receive the one who is weak in faith, and do not have disputes over differing opinions. One person believes in eating everything, but the weak person eat, eats only vegetables. Now, see, I disagree with Paul on this. <laughs> The one who eats everything must not despise the one who does not, and the one who abstains must not judge the one who eats everything, for God has accepted him. Who are you to pass judgment on another servant? Before this, his own master, he stands or fails, or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day holier than another day. Another regards them all alike. Each must be fully convinced in his own mind. There, the one who observes the day does it, does it for the Lord. The one who eats, eats it for the Lord because he gives thanks to God. And the one who abstains from eating abstains from, for the Lord. And he gives thanks to God. 
And none of us live for the, himself, and none dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now the Lord here, and we, when we talk about the Lord, we're talking about God. We're talking about the presence of the divine. We're talking about the divine in our lives. And so what I hear in this myself is, in our community and in our coming together, we are all in different places. And we're going to be in different places. We're our different understandings. We have different experiences. We have those who are, are very, um, very, you might say, very uh, early in their spiritual growth. And then we have those who have, are not quite ready to graduate yet, but, you know. <laughs> and then we have those who are very mature in uh, being able to notice and pay attention to their ego voice. And we have those who have no clue that they even have an ego voice. Does that make sense? And so one of the things that we can do in that rec recognition is to recognize that we are all on, in different places, and yet we are all here for the purpose of awakening to a deeper and richer experience of our connection with the divine. And we can support each other in doing that. So recognizing that we're going to see things differently. So for example... If I were to um, ask Lissy to describe what she sees here on, on this podium, or, 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 or this podium, this music stand, thank you. See? Different words for different things, isn't it? She would see one thing. And if I asked Julie to describe what she sees, she would see something different, wouldn't she? And yet what we have a tendency to do is, we have a tendency to say, well, no, it's this way because this is how I see it. One of my good friends, Dr. Gary Bettis, taught me a wonderful little trick that he does in, in doing counseling with uh, couples. And one of the things that he does is he has a couple in this counseling session, he will ask them, you'll have maybe the husband to say, okay, I want you to imagine that you're in the front of your house, looking back at your house. And I want you to describe that house to me. And then he'll have the wife Imagine that she is in the back of the house, looking back at the house, and I want you to describe that house to me. And naturally, it's not the same description. And he asks them a very simple question. Which one of you is right? Which one of you is right? The reality is we, have both, we all have different points of view. And if we become attached to our point of view, then we find ourselves in conflict. We find ourselves challenged by thinking that our point of view is the only one that counts, or the only one that matters, or thinking that our point of view is the right one. So I came across another little tidbit about difficult people. I've been a difficult person in my life, I want you to know. I confess, I have, yeah. Sometimes difficult people are like tools. Some difficult people like, are like tools in the tool shed. So you've got a measuring tape, right? These are people always let us know that we don't quite measure up. <laughs> they uh, are looking for and, and expecting perfection. But their purpose is in our lives is not necessarily to try and get us to measure up to their standards, but to ask us, let us find out what, we, what are our standards? Where do we come from? Where are we in life? In short, if we judge people by our standards, we can bet that we're not measuring up. Let me say that again. If we are measuring someone by our standards, it's we who are not measuring up because we're not recognizing and honoring that everybody has a different way of looking and seeing things and understanding things. Another one is a hammer. Now, we, there are hammers in life. Right? These people are as subtle as a freight train they push their agendas on others and force their will. Everyone walks on eggshells around a hammer because we never know when the hammer is going to come down. They're stubbornly committed to use force in whatever way that it works for them to get their way. Some people are like skill saws. You know, they just 
They just say the thing that will hurt the most. They have a great ability to cut to the quick and leave others bleeding on the floor. Skill saws win verbal arguments every time, not because they're right, because they know where to cut. Uh, these are all describing not just people, but ego states of consciousness, I would say. In fact, it's a better way of understanding this, that this is a, actually probably something within every one of us to some extent. And, and it's something that we um, can learn from. Now, there, then there's vice grips. Vice grips, you know? People who get a grip and don't want to let go. <laughs> They're extra needy, usually squeeze a life out of us. So they they uh, have no clue when it comes to social and relational boundaries. They bounce from one crisis to the next, needing constant support and encouragement. They don't care about the relationships in our lives. Our attention must be focused on them. And then there's the grinders, people with explosive personalities just waiting to go off. <laughs> and then there's the axes. The ten, they tend to be negative, always grumbling and looking for ways to tear down in hopes and dreams of others. And then there's the hatches. They take smaller chops than an axe, but hold on to past hurts and grudges much longer. They don't know how to bury the hatchet. And then there's the putty. <laughs> People who have no backbone. Enter, they are eager to please and always agreeable. We never know who they really are or what they really think. So when we think about this, it's, the way this is listed, it's listed as people. But I think this is actually a viable list for us to look at, our, in our, at ourselves. Am I being an, an ax at times? <laughs> Am I being putty? Am I being uh, uh, like uh, a skill saw? So when we're working with moving back into a place of agreeing and disagreeing and love, we have three steps that we look, uh, the first three steps we're going to work with this week. One of the things that we want to be able to do is affirm the truth. We affirm the truth of ourselves. We affirm the truth of the other. As we affirm the truth of the other, we're able to see beyond the personality. We're able to see beyond our differences. We're willing to take that step and say, wait a minute, this is another spiritual being. This is a spiritual being living in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual laws. Sometimes in order to do that, we have to say that for ourselves first. We have to recognize the truth of who and what we are. See, the reality is when we get into conflict and we, we feel like we have, to, uh, uh, we have to be right, who do you have to be in order to need to be right? Let me say that again. Who do you have to be in order to need to be right? So if you have a need to be right, you can almost guarantee, no, I'm going to take that even stronger. You can guarantee that you are feeling not right. Let me say it again. <laughs> if you have a need to be right, you are feeling not right. And you're trying to get the other person to agree with you so that you can feel right. And so you're trying to get your needs met of being right. And the, the reality is you don't really need to be right. None of us really needs to be right. What we need is to be true. And to be true, we need to be true to ourself to that spirit of God within ourselves, and we need to come from a place of reality and truth and be able to speak that truth from the heart and be able to express the truth of who and what we are without the need for anyone ever to change. Oh, wait a minute. See, if we need someone else to change, why do we need them to change? So we can be right? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> So if we need someone else to change, 
in order for us to tune into the truth of who and what we are, what are we really doing? Are we making that other, in some way, our deity? Are we trying to get them to be a certain way so that we can feel a certain way? So the reality is, the more we come from a place of centeredness within ourselves and really able to honor that spirit of God within ourselves, it allows us to then to look to the other and recognize that there is a presence of God within that other person that is looking at life and seeing life from two different perceptions and two different perspectives. And the eyes of the divine become even wider. And you can see that there is an inclusion that we can participate in that allows us to see even more than we see with our own physical eyes. We can have a different perception. We can actually take on the view and the eyes of this other person and look at the house or the podium from a different perspective and say, oh, I see what you're talking about. I don't agree, but I can see where you're coming from. You can disagree and still have and hold your perception and say, well, my perception works for me. I see things in a way that really work for me. And if it doesn't work for me, I have a choice, don't I? I have a choice. I have a choice to see differently, to see the, myself differently, to see the world differently. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. So our work is really to bring about a, a place where we can see from a, a larger perspective and see each other in a different way, to see the truth of who and what we are and recognize that everyone that we deal with and come in contact with is there to show us how we can expand our own energy and awareness of the truth. And then the third step that we look at is that we commit to pray. We pray. We examine where we are coming from and release our need to be right. Release our need to be right. You know, we may be right, but if you have a need to be right, you're not. <laughs> That's a judgment, of course, but... Having a need to be right is one of the things that will challenge our relationships every time. And it's not coming from the truth of our nature because the reality is the truth of our nature has no need to be right. Do you realize that? Our spirit has no need to be right. Our spirit is whole and complete and true. There's a truth within you that is so much more important and more valuable than being right. You know, the Course in Miracles tells us, would you rather be right or happy? <laughs> there is a choice. Some people say, well, I want both. But if you have a need to be right, you're not very happy. Isn't that true? And so part of our work in working with overcoming our challenges and difficulties, our conflicts, our, our differences, is to be willing to let go of the need to be right. And the more we can let go of that need to be right and just simply allow ourselves and the other to be who and what we are, where we are, and to recognize that there's a different way of seeing, then we can move into an understanding that really connects us again, that helps us move back into relationship, back into community, back into connection. And then the next part is we acknowledge that all parties have needs and we pray for win-win solutions. No prayers for my success or for the other to change. Dear God, please change this person so, so that I can feel okay about myself. It's one of the things that we do. What if we change our prayer? Please help me to see differently. Please help me to change and release my need to be right. Please bring about the highest and best for all concerned. Please bring about 
an understanding that lifts us both into a different experience in our relationship. When we pray for another in unity, we have a very clear idea and awareness about what we've learned is in a very effective way of praying. It's called positive prayer. It's not a begging and beseeching. It is really a holding and awareness of the spiritual well-being and wholeness of the other. It's lifting that person in our own thoughts and feelings to another level. We have a tendency to do just the opposite oftentimes in relationships. We tend to put our thoughts toward finding where everybody else is wrong or finding their faults or finding where they don't meet our expectations. And in the very act of doing that, we are creating separation. We are dissolving relationships. We are harming community. But in the very act of turning that around and using that same faculty, interestingly enough, we use the same faculty of imagination, of faith, of love, and care and compassion. If we use those in that way, combine it with that love, care, and compassion, it's easy to see that everyone that we are working with and dealing with is there to help teach us how we can bring out more of our own light. They're there to show us how we can shift that energy and lift each other into another experience of wholeness and to see each other from a, a more loving place and see each other experiencing the blessings that they wish to have for themselves. See them experiencing the healing that they want to have. See them experiencing the prosperity they want to have. Well, this works in our spiritual community. It works in our, our, our family relationships. It works in our, our, our partner relationships. It works in our work relationships. So these are some of the tools that we have available to us, and they're based on very sound principles, very sound spiritual principles that were discovered actually thousands of years ago in the very early times of the Christian church and even beyond because many of these things that were taught came out of the Jewish culture. So in James chapter 5 verse 16, Paul says, so confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness. The prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness. So a righteous person is one who is coming from a place of alignment with their own true nature. And if we're coming from an awareness of alignment of our own true nature and we hold another person in that light, there's a great effect in bringing about a healing. There's a great effect in bringing about change. So these, you know, there's a little homework for us. These are wonderful little, little reminders of how we can really, one, be in this spiritual community and support each other. And I bring this into uh, every ministry that I have come into, and it's really worked extremely well. Not that we haven't had conflicts, but we've been able to remind ourselves to go back and look at these again and go, oh, yeah, well, here's a way that I can work with this. Here's a way that I can change and shift my awareness. Here's a way that I can lift myself into a different space. Here's a way that I can see things from a different place. So I invite you to take some time. This is out on our website. If you'll go on our uh, Unity website and look under About, and it'll have a listing of the Agree and Disagree and Love, and you can click on a link and you'll pull it up. This one is actually one that we signed back in 2012, and our new leadership and board will be invited to sign a new one. And you're invited to join us in working with these principles in our spiritual community, but also just notice those and your own relationships in life and how they can actually help you to, to remind yourself of how you can come into and deepen and strengthen your own authentic relationships. When we talked about confessing our sin, sin really is basically an error of awareness. We talk about that as just being vulnerable, being honest, being sincere, being clear with who and what we are. I love the sincerity of Courtney this morning and just sharing where she was coming from and Jude and, and how he talked about how people could share what they needed to share. And I think we can enhance that building of community and love and acceptance in this way.
As we move into our meditation time, move into a comfortable place. You may want to take a moment, and if you have something in your laps, gently set it aside. Take a nice deep breath and gently let your eyes close. Let your awareness move into your heart space. And as you breathe in and out through the heart space, notice if there's any conflicts that you have within yourself. Any conflicts that you might have had with another person. And just notice and be open and receptive to feeling and seeing things differently. Let your heart be open to a different view, a different vision, a greater possibility. If you are connected with a need to be right, are you willing to release that so that a deeper relationship, a higher experience can come through? Are you willing to allow the eyes of spirit to see through you? And now, are you willing to see this other as a child of the divine? a spiritual light, a spiritual being, to look beyond the fear, the hurt, the need, or perhaps their need to be right. Are you willing to experience a win-win? Are you willing to hold them up in your awareness? And see the good, see the truth, see the light. And in your heart and mind, know that the Spirit of God is working in and through you to shift the energy, the consciousness, the feelings, the experiences in that relationship. And a greater good is unfolding. And just know that that is happening as you shift and give thanks. And so it is. Take a nice deep breath. Take one more nice deep breath. Let that energy of the heart expand and give thanks for the healing that's taking place, even now. And one more nice deep breath, and let your awareness come into this room, this time and place. Be here and now, present. <laughs>